In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the beautiful weather. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to spend time in your word as we continue to study Psalm 119 tonight. Open our hearts and minds to remember that the power of your word is to bring comfort and to strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, one thing that I told you guys a while back, and I actually told you wrong, so I've got to set the record straight. We talked about Luther's discovery of the gospel, okay, and how when he had his tower moments, as they call it, that he was reading uh, Galatians, and he comes across Paul, and that man is saved by faith, and they always make a big deal. He writes alone right in his Bible in the tower, which he never did. Uh, but when he rediscovered the gospel, a lot of biographers have said that, you know, that he had never read the gospel. He had never heard the gospel when he was a monk because it's the way monks lived. Uh, turns out that's not entirely true. I was taught that from when I was a little one in Lutheran school, too. Um, but since I said that at the class I was taking in church history at the seminary, where find one of our big assignments was to pick a Luther biography and write a, a book review of it. And I picked Schwiebert because I had it on my shelf. It's not like we could run to the library and check out Luther biographies when you're distance learning. So I have Schwiebert. It was written in the 1950s. It's huge. It's like that thick. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I picked that one because uh, I think I got brownie points from the professor for taking out a 900-page book. And it, the interesting thing about Schwiebert, and I had forgotten this because when you read it as a kid, you read it like at lightning speed and none of it sticks to you, uh, is that he actually talks about Luther's discovery of the gospel and how that tower moment thing was perhaps not entirely true. And I mentioned it in my report, uh, we talked about uh, that he may have very well read the gospels before he became a monk, uh, before he became a priest, uh, in, when he was uh, in law school. And I'm getting to it here. Okay, so, uh, and he spends a whole chapter on it, uh, and he calls it the triumph of biblical humanism, of which Luther was uh, kind of one of the beginning people about that, so that, that the Bible not only teaches you about spiritual things, it teaches you about how you're supposed to live here. Uh, so biblical humanism, he was the first one of the first biblical humanists. Uh, and we see in that biography also his slow progression to be actually becoming Lutheran. Luther was not always Lutheran. Um, around 95 Theses time, he's not remotely Lutheran yet. There's, that's why the 95 Theses are not in the Book of Concord. They're not Lutheran. They're not remotely. Uh, but he began with a steady progression, so it's not like he all of a sudden discovered the gospel in that tower moment, but he began, and we have it in some of his writings, that he started with his lectures on Genesis, his works in English, the American edition of Luther's works, the first five volumes are his lectures on Genesis, and then the next ones are volumes on his lectures on the Psalms. And he not only revolutionized the way people studied in school, uh, he began to develop his method of interpreting the Bible, which eventually would become Lutheranism, we, what we would think of as, as being Lutheran. Uh, but again, he didn't, it's not that he had never seen like a Bible before, or never heard the gospel. That's, that's kind of become Lutheran folklore, uh, and it's been repeated as if it's fact, so I wanted to stick, uh, set the record straight on that. Uh, that it may be, have been, he may have been introduced to it early, he may have been introduced to the gospel gradually, or he may have had his tower experience, but the, the evidence on the tower experience when he was in, if you're, if you're not Lutheran, uh, when I mean tower experience, when he was excommunicated and declared a heretic, and then also was under the death penalty by the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, he went into hiding at the Warburg Castle, uh, and it was in the Warburg Castle for like 12 weeks or so that he translated the New Testament from the Greek into German, uh, which was kind of revolutionary at the time. Uh, the Bible had already been translated into English by that time, uh, and the fellow who was uh, responsible for that was uh, burned at the stake. 
And then his bones dug up and then burned those and then dumped them in the river. Like after he was already dead and buried. So uh, yeah, they, they kind of took that stuff seriously. So that is when he translated the Bible and then always in the Luther movies, you see him up there going, oh, and the light bulbs go on. It's probably not how it happened. It, he probably didn't hear it in his youth either. But like I said, it was a gradual reading the Bible as he was becoming a monk, becoming a priest. Where are you, Wes? Hmm? The West Vehicle. What's that? The West Vehicle. Oh, oh that. that might be. Maybe, maybe they both came. Um, and then I wanted to point out also, because we have that new biography of Luther on our bookshelf over there, the one by Eric Metaxis. Uh, just so you know, there's like a mistake in the first chapter. So. Uh -huh. Take it with a grain of salt. Most of the general knowledge stuff is fine. Go ahead and read it. Uh, but I wouldn't write a book report on it. Or I wouldn't write an actual biography report of Luther using him as a source. He's not a, he's not a biographer. It's a popular account, and it shows. It talks about, uh, what was it? Not Stop. It's, it was his father confessor. The, the, cat, the cardinal. It'll come to me. Well, they talked about this one Roman Catholic fellow being there at the Diet of Worms, which he was nowhere near it. He wasn't even in that position in the church yet. He's just got just general historical inaccuracies in the book, and it's right there in the first chapter. So take it with a grain of salt. But it's popular. It's easy to read. Schwiebert is the definitive, <laughs> definitive biography on Luther by all accounts from every professor you ask. It's not easy to read. Because it's just like, okay, we're on page 300 and we haven't talked about Luther yet. It's all background in history. What was the world like when he was born? Blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, if you want a tough book that's got all the angles covered, that's the book to read. But it's interesting from the perspective of education, of which Lutherans are big on teaching, right? We have lots, had a lot of schools, that it showed how Luther changed the way that people are taught. Uh, so that was kind of neat. <laughs> And actually, the way they were taught, I'll just spend a minute on this um, since I'm thinking of it. The, what they used to do when these guys would give these lectures, they would have like a big piece of paper, like a piece of paper like this. And they would write whatever text they were studying because copying was part of studying because if you write it, it's like reading it 11 times. And then in the margins, you would write your professor's notes and your notes. And Luther started doing away with that. That like, yeah, we're not doing this this way. Uh, we have some of this stuff. We have some of Luther's actual notes, too. Uh, so he kind of revolutionized the way theology was studied. He was a, he, guy was a genius. He did a lot of things first, and then uh, a lot of things that he did that he managed to not get killed for, which was nice. All right, so that's enough about Luther, but I wanted to set the record straight on that, that, that the fact that he had never read the Gospels before until he was an adult probably is just a little bit of a misleading myth. Anyhow, okay, so we are in Psalm 119 again. Uh, we are in verse 49. And our goals tonight will be, as we said in the opening prayer, this the next segment, uh, that's the beginning of verse 49, that's the Hebrew letter Zion. Uh, not to be confused with Zion. Uh, Zion. Uh, that section is going to be about the power of God's word to comfort and strengthen people. And then the next section summary is uh, hurrying to God with all my heart. And then we're only going to do those two sections tonight because there's a lot going on. Okay. I am going to read from Robert Alter's translation again. Was anybody, who, who wasn't here last week? I don't remember. We were all here last week. We were all here last week? Awesome. Okay, so you guys know, remember who Robert Alter is. So I am going to read from his translation again, beginning in verse 49. I've read my Bible out. Okay, good. Greek Old Testament. I will cheat tonight. All right, Psalm 119, beginning in verse 49. Recall the word to your servant for which you made me hope. This is my consolation in my affliction, that your utterance gave me life. The arrogant mocked me terribly. From your teaching, I did not turn. I recalled your laws forever. O Lord, and I was, count I was consoled. 
Rage from the wicked seized me, from those who forsake your teaching. Songs were your statutes to me in the house of my sojourning. I recalled in the night your name, O Lord, and I observed your teaching. This did I possess, for your decrees I kept. The Lord is my portion, I said, to observe your words. I entreated you with a whole heart. Grant me grace as befits your utterance. I have reckoned my ways and turned back my feet to your precepts. I hastened and did not linger to observe your commands. The cords of the wicked ensnared me. Your teaching I did not forget. At midnight I rose to acclaim you for your righteous laws. A friend am I to all who fear you, and to those who observe your decrees. With your kindness, Lord, the earth is filled. Teach me your statutes. How close was that to your... What version am I reading? I don't know. Contemporary English version. Oh, boy. Yeah, you maybe want to chuck that. (laughs) Well, I didn't bring mine, so... It's entertaining, because I would note in this that every... Every other thought is reversed. So yeah. when he said one thing, that was the second part of the verse. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Same okay, part. so what's 57 say in there? What's verse 57 say? You, Lord, are my choice, and I will obey you. Okay, that's not so bad. How about the next verse, 58? With all my heart, I beg you to be kind to me. Just as you have promised. That's terrible. Okay. Yeah, throw that out. <laughs> that was not good. Sometimes those paraphrase translations are okay. I, there's a new one. It's not new. It's a couple of years old now that I just discovered. It's called the Evangelical Heritage Version, which, ooh, that sounds weird. That's actually what the Wisconsin Synod is using. Uh, it is based on the... Uh, the, the, what is it based on? It is based on the Masoretic text, uh, so it's more King Jamesy. It's but it's more contemporary English, but it's based on what was known of the manuscripts at the time the King James was written. Let's put it that way. So they go up to like 1668 and stop all the manuscripts discovered after that. They didn't use them, uh, so they just translated it, but did it into a more modern English. So it's. It's okay. It's not bad. The New King James is actually easier to read. Um, it's clunky in a couple places, but if you're looking for something that's a little easier to read sometimes, give it a try. You can read it online for free. Buying a copy of it's a little spendy, but, but that's available. But I like the New King James if you want something old, like older style. The New King James has just got the language is a little updated, but not totally, but it takes all the manuscripts into account, which is nice. Um, or read it in German, because Luther's New Testament still holds up after everything that's been discovered since his, he lived. His translation, you look at it and compare it to the Greek, and it's still mm. awesome. It still holds up. Uh, I don't know why. It just does. Okay, so this first section, the Lord is my, it's not where we started. Uh, Recall the word to your servant for which you made me hope. And we have, remember the word to your servant in which you have made me hope. That's pretty close, okay? Uh, So we're talking about the ability of God's word to comfort and strengthen. So, you know, remember the word dear servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort and my affliction for your word has given me life. Um, this is a little different. This is different than the psalmist saying, I'm not going to forget your word. Now he is saying, God, you don't forget your word to your servant. It's kind of like how we talked about earlier about Uh, entreating God to remember the covenants, remember the promises you've made to us. It's like, okay, Lord, you made this promise, deliver to us, give us what you promised. And that is what he is doing with his law, what the psalmist is saying. Remember the word you've given me that gives me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction for your word has given me life. Or your word has revived me. That's the word we used last week too, this idea of reviving. Uh, because, of course, God's never going to forget his word, right? 
So we're again asking God to fulfill his promises because God wants us to do that. He wants us to remember the promises he made to us and wants us to come to him with those promises. Uh, And then this is an interesting thought is whenever we hear a promise in the word, let's turn it into a prayer. So when we hear God's promises, we turn those promises into a prayer because we bring them to him. God, you promised me this. Now I'm bringing it to you in prayer because that's how we talk to God. So every time you hear a promise, that's a prayer. It's an opportunity to pray. Um, And that's kind of a little bit what people are talking about when they talk about praying scripture. Because we all understand praying. And we kind of understand praying the Psalms because they're prayers. But just reading the Bible and actually praying the Bible. How do you pray the Bible? You read it and you meditate on it and then you... Okay, God's making me promises in this. He's promising me a savior. Okay, I am going to pray about the forgiveness of my sins, which you know Christ won for me on the cross. And sometimes different stories in the Bible will bring more specific ideas, but you can turn those into, into prayers. Just like, oh, let's pick a story at random. Somebody pick a story from the Old Testament. Pick an easy Moses one. Which in the one? brushes. Hmm? Moses in the brushes. In the you mean reeds. when he was born? When, when his mother sent him off into the weeds. I said pick an easy one. I gotta, oh. Now i got to think that. <laughs> no. Um. Okay, so that's like, I'm trying to remember what she said. Did she say anything? I don't remember. She yeah. asked that he be protected. Okay. And he was. Okay, there you go. See? Don't look at me. I try, I say I'm overthinking. Samuel's mother is excellent example of praying. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, those are actual prayers in scripture. Okay. Right. So look at it. Let's look at a story where, where we read the story and we can turn somewhere. God gives a promise in that. And we can turn that into a prayer. I'm thinking of the ark off the top of my head. Okay. So God shut the door. He shut them in. What do you think those eight people prayed for while they're on that boat? Mm-hmm. Lord, please, you know, let this end soon. And but he, he knows that they knew that God was destroying the world because of its sin. So I imagine, you can imagine these people are praying for what's going to happen to us when we get out. Because we're still, were they sinning on the boat? Do you think they ever argued with each other? I'm sure they did, like any family. So they were thinking, oh, God did this to the world because of sin. And wow, we're doing the same thing in here. Don't do this to us when we get out. That would be awful. Now I'm reading into the text. You know, I'm, I'm making up an idea of what I'm thinking, which you're not really supposed to do. But after you got shut in the boat and you got all these animals to take care of, what was going through their mind? Their, what was going through their mind, especially at the beginning, because they could hear what was happening. It was like, okay, Lord, don't let this happen to us. You saved us for a reason. Please don't let us, like, sink, right? And then, of course, God goes over and above, gives them the rainbow of the covenant when they get out. Okay, maybe that wasn't the easiest one. Um, But that's the idea. So we we can think of, obviously, God's wrath and God's condemnation of sin, which is always in front of us. Uh, Maybe that one's too easy, though. Because they're all going to turn into you, us repenting and asking for grace, asking to be held in grace. Okay, that didn't go as well as I thought. We're talking about the ark. Yeah. Have all of you folks been to see the ark? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Actually. Down in Kentucky? Yeah. How many have seen it? I haven't. You just told me about it when well, you, you guys came back. That, that sounded pretty neat. Up. It's something else. Our daughter lives about a half hour from it down in Kentucky. Oh, yeah? It's, it's really interesting to go see it. Now, whether this is a true interpretation of what the ark might have, the interior of the ark might have looked like, mm-hmm. but uh, man's interpretation of what it would have been like to live on the ark is really phenomenal. It's huge. Three, oh, three levels. Mm-hmm. The animals were down in the, well, the feet. The quarters for the people. As well as something up on the upper deck, you know, but the, it was bad, real bad. They lived down inside it. It's worth the trip, especially if you got a child, and, you know. Um, and then they also have that creation museum, and it's not all crazy either. Mm-hmm. 
you know. Yeah, th those are pretty neat, and the, that's Ken Ham's thing, the Creation Museum, right? The Answers, Answers in Genesis guy? Yeah. Well, the, the ARC and the museum are the same corporation of people. Okay. All right, here's a good quote from uh, St. Augustine. Uh, when Augustine talked about bringing before God his own handwriting, he called it. And his mother said, uh, well, won't God not... Won't God remember his word? I'm sorry, I screwed that up. Augustine related this, St. Augustine related the story of his mother saying that we bring before God his own handwriting. So that's kind of special, you know, because this is all we have. What God reveals to us is in his word. So you're bringing God's handwriting to him and praying those same word, words back. And she said, well, then yeah, will he not remember his word that he gave us? Uh, When he gives us a promise, this is Spurgeon again. Um, when he gives a promise, he binds himself with cords of his own making. He binds himself down to such and such a course when he says that such and such a thing shall be. Hence, when you grab the promise, you get a hold on God, is what Spurgeon said. And a lot of people find that language a little weird to say that God binds himself with his words, but he does. He, will, he cannot break his promises. So if he's promised it, we can take that to the bank. So like Spurgeon is saying, he ties himself by his promises. So if you grab a hold of that promise, you grab a hold of God. And, the, you know, once again, the psalmist is not putting his trust and hope in himself. You know, it's not his own greatness, it's not his own spirituality, it is only God's grace in the world given to him by his word, by his law. So the word of God is irrevocable, uh, it's worthy of our laying hold of. Uh, God's word never returns to him void, or God's word never returns to him empty, as uh, Paul says. Paul? I think it's Paul. Um, when one, of the, uh, one of these guys wrote an illustration. He said, okay, find the snowflakes that God's word and his promises are like the rain and the snow. Find the snowflakes that make their way back to heaven. They don't. Find the rain that finds its way back to the cloud. It doesn't. It, it can't. It doesn't do that. Uh, God's word's the same thing. It comes from him. It flows from him to us. It doesn't go... We give it back to him, but it doesn't return. It goes from him to us back to him through us. So it's not returning empty. We've turned it into prayer. It's not like it just falls on deaf ears and goes back, which is what Paul is saying. The word never returns empty. It always does that for which it was sent. You know, and again, the theme that started at the beginning of the psalm, we were talking about someone who is being afflicted. Uh, and this is his comfort. You know, he finds comfort in his affliction because uh, God's word has brought him comfort in the past, and he's saying, "Well, it is working for me once again." So that is why he trusts it. Verse forty-two. But then he says in verse forty-three is interesting because verse forty-three. I went backwards. I'm in the wrong part. Fifty-three. Fifty-three. I got lost. Where am I going? Oh, I'm sorry, 51. You ever get a murder when I do not turn? Okay, so then 51, it's the same idea. Okay, so the the arrogant out there, you know, they'll, they're making fun of them. What are you doing? You know, you're an idiot. Why are you reading this old stuff? Why are you praying? That doesn't do anything. But he's saying, I don't turn aside from your law. I've remembered your ordinances from of old, and I comfort myself. So he's not taking the word of others, even though he's being afflicted. You know, he doesn't let that get him. His comfort is still the word. And then a new emotion comes up. Burning indignation, indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. So these godless people are making me angry. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't like that these people are not listening to your word. I'm, I'm comforted by it. 
but these these wicked people, what am I going to do with those who forsake your laws? For my your statutes are my songs. You know, these are my prayers. I give them back to you. I remember your name in the night. I keep your law. This has become mine. He's taking possession of the word. That it's his. That he observes everything that it says. Wow. Which is interesting. You know, the, one of the things we have to remember too is when the psalmists say that I keep your law. You know, I, I keep your law. It doesn't mean you're keeping it perfectly. We don't keep it perfectly. It's, the psalmist is not keeping it perfectly. You know, so he's holding on to the law. He keeps it. One of the things the law always does is the law always accuses. The law always kills. The law has one purpose, to kill. And two purposes. But the main purpose is to con convict your conscience to turn in repentance. And he's clinging to that, that, okay, the law shows me my sin. And I lay it out before you and I ask for forgiveness. I'm not going to forsake your law, even though I know I can't do it. I'm going to cling to it because I know that's what you want me to do after I receive forgiveness is to do things for my neighbor. Again, I'm reading into it a little bit. I'm stretching it a little bit. Uh, let's see. Is. Where is? Where have I known? Oh, yeah, I get to keep forgetting that that word revived or giving life back in verse 50. Um, <clears throat> the word of God gives life. You look at the, the action of the verb there. So the word has revived me, or the word has given me life. It's the word that is the active player. And then the psalmist is the recipient. He's the subject of the action, or the object of the action. So, you know, he's talking about how the word is life itself. So, it's not the pastor preaching it that gives it life. It isn't us reading it that gives it life. It has life of its own. My little note says, um, this is my comfort in my affliction that thy word has revived me. And then my little note says, preserve me alive. Mm, that's nice. I like that. that. Yeah, so you get that sense of, uh, well, that sense of preservation that it's like a, a ball. I guess you could call it like a balm. You know, it's something that you it is applied to you and it holds you till you get more of it. And the way I think of that is like our we our daily like devotional time every day where you get that that little bit to get you going for the day, a little bit, a little bit, it gets us through the week, and then you come and you get the big main course on Sunday or dessert, depends on which way you like to look at it. Uh, you know, where you get word and sacrament together as a community. You know, is that the dessert? Is that the main course? It's the dessert. It's the icing on the cake as you get the medicine of eternal life. Uh, so it's a full meal, full, four course meal, it's called. So the, but you get to do it together in community. And then you get to go off and you have snacks of the word during the week. And I'm really laboring this metaphor. You <laughs> stop. Snacks. But yeah. It's, <laughs> My daughter keeps talking to me about snacks, so I have snacks <laughs> on the brain. So I like snacks too. Hmm. I talked about that. Now, 56. Mm -hmm. You have blessed me because I, all, I have always followed your teachings. Well, uh, yeah, that translation is horrible. What, what there does is a your lot 56 they added. say? 56, this has become mine that I observe your precepts. So okay. I don't know where they got, so i got to look at the Greek real quick. Just, 56, 19, 56. Yeah. What's that? Mine says because I kept mine too. your uh, precepts. You guys reading NIV? Which I'm one? doing uh, NAS. NAS? What's NAS? What's that one? This has become mine. That I observe my precepts, no, no. but then it's no who says because. What's the NAS translation? What does it stand for? It says because. No, no NA, NAS, NAS, that version. Oh, what, what New is American it? Standard. Oh, okay. Okay. 
You know, it's great to have all this electronic stuff so you don't gotta carry umpteen books with you, but it's still easier to look stuff up in a book. Hmm. Okay, 56 is... Da -da -da. Yeah, now yeah. The, the Greek Old Testament, which the Greek Old Testament is what Jesus is quoting all the time in the New Testament. So if you ever look in your Bible and you see Jesus quote something and he goes, oh, that's from Isaiah, and you read Isaiah and the Isaiah doesn't say that, it's because your Old Testament's translated out of the Hebrew. Jesus is Jesus is quoting the Septuagint every single time. So the Greek Old Testament for verse fifty-six says, uh, actually says, uh, let's see, in the night I remembered, O Lord, your name and your law I kept. So it has that in the night. Uh, uh, yeah, nighty in the night and nighty. Mine's in the present tense, though. Yeah, tenses in Greek are weird sometimes. Is that is mine not as correct then? Oh, uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to go that far. Thy name. It's probably and keep thy love. It's probably pretty close to the Hebrew, which I can't read, so I can't verify that. Okay. But. Now, can night? If you're looking at night, be. When I was in distress, I mean, night is a negative kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, I well, when are when are you arguing? When are you fighting your demons? It's when you're by yourself. So that kind of makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in what does your fifty-five have? Because you know they might have transposed that. Oh, they did. Okay. Huh? That's what it is it's from fifty-five. Even in the night, I think about you. Yeah. Yeah, now see in 55. Yeah, see, the, the, the verses are a little bit weird sometimes, but. Um, what did you say? It's like, oh Lord, uh, let's see, your law as strummed chords of music were to me your ordinances. Like, that's a little flowerier than what we've Which got. Which one is that? That's 55. Or no, that's 54. Yeah, see, it's it's the, the, this is the yeah this is the Old Testament in Greek, okay. the Septuagint. But it, it's just because of where the verse numbers are a little different too. Okay. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that too much. But yeah, that I remembered in the night. That actually belongs to what's in our verse numbers are just. Okay. Yeah. So what is the? And I wouldn't worry too much about verse numbers anyway because they didn't even have those things until like the middle of the 15th, 16th century. Yeah. Mary Lou had a different translation. Okay, what have you got, Mary Lou? Well, this is the new century version. Okay. okay. And uh, 55 and 56. Lord, I remember you at night and I will obey your teachings. This is what I do. I follow your orders. Huh. Okay, that's interesting. Did anybody read the NIV? No. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. In the night I remember your name, O oh Lord, I will keep your law. This has been my practice. I obey your precepts. It's pretty close. Oh, it's pretty, like it's pretty close to what we got. Let's see, I gotta jump over to you. Go ahead. <laughs> what is yours? NLT. Okay. I reflect at night on who you are, O oh Lord. Therefore, I obey your instructions. This is how I spend my life, obeying your commandments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I am going to just for grins, 49 to 64. Because I can pull up like, I love uh, Bible Gateway. Because you can put par in parallel like six translations if you want. Why are you not doing what I want? I have e sword. Oh, e sword. Oh, yeah, you, you can do the same thing with that, too. Um, really? Okay, I guess I'm not getting on Bible Gateway. Uh, anyway, never now, mind. Who, I have no internet, so Who I do we do credit translating uh, the Bible into English? Uh, more than one guy. Well, sure. Um, sure. I think, was it uh, Tyndale? Tinsdale was the big one. Yeah. And then Wycliffe? And then Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Yeah. Yeah. 
what's the guy's name? Uh, Tyndale. 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 William Tyndale, William Tyndale, and then was it John Wycliffe? I don't remember his first name. I can't remember his first name, Wycliffe. Now it was Tinsdale that was burned, wasn't it? The yeah. first one and Wycliffe survived? Yeah, I think Tinsdale might actually have been the guy that got burned, buried, mm -hmm. dug back up and burned again. And I keep saying that's John Huss, but it's, it wasn't Huss. I think it was him. Well, uh, yeah, I think it was Tyndale, actually. Well, no, because I remember Wycliffe kept printing his Bibles and disseminating them in yeah. Europe, too. Yeah. 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 And so that's, you know, they smuggled his Bibles and he kept mm -hmm. printing them. So I thought that was interesting for those that had left and spoke English. To have that much courage, you know? Yeah, that's... Mixed. That's a tough one. Like, okay, hang on. Look. I just got to get myself some. And people are still doing here. that today. Oh yeah. Smuggling Bibles. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we found out um, was some missionary that came um, was mentioning that in Africa probably still is this way. Uh, they would take one page of the Bible and run from village to village. You know, once that person was done, or that group, that village was done with that page. They're going to the next village. That's yeah. how much they treasure God's word. You know, whatever page that might have been. Yeah, I think that there's there's a series of, of novels for young people right now that CPH actually published surprisingly because usually they don't CPH publish. CPH Concordia. Yeah, okay. and it is. Uh, I forgot what it is, but I think they use that as their example. Uh, so it's the story is about this future time and these kids are part of this network and adults too where they run around and they just try to find, they might find one verse because the Bibles have been destroyed. So they're, they just run around and they're like, oh, we found a verse we don't have. Yeah. And then they would smuggle it boop, 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 to this big underground network where people mm. are worshiping literally underground. But the idea of just smuggling the verses around, mm -hmm. I think they got from that actually happening, yeah. which is kind of neat. And there was a minister that we heard once who challenged us because um, he said, well, all right, if all the Bibles were eradicated and you were like, like us here in this room and each of us spouts out the Bible verses we've memorized, how much of the Bible we, would we be able to put out? Not much. Oh. That's a kind of conviction. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. how much have I memorized of it? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing, just as an apologetic standpoint, not really dealing with the Psalms, but um, one of the interesting things about what would happen if uh, someone came and took all our Bibles. And, like, let's say all of the manuscripts in all the museums, like, somebody just purges them, these have to go. So we'll purge the, ori the originals, and it, could happen. and it could happen. You know, they could have a burning, like at the Library of Alexandria, right? Yeah. So all the manuscripts and all the museums get burned, and then they start taking our Bibles. They got a lot of other stuff they got to find because the the church fathers, in their writings alone, oh, yeah. they can almost we can almost reconstruct the entire Bible just from them quoting in their writings. That's true. So if all the manuscripts went away, we could still get the Bible from their writings unless uh -huh. they find all those. But it's just remarkable that almost the whole thing's been quoted by all these guys writing sermons and commentaries and letters and all this stuff. Okay, it's verses 55 and 56 in Luther's, the Luther Bible. And I'm going to embarrass myself with my translating tonight, but let's see, this is my... Uh, what is this? This is my. Yeah. But this is the first one we're looking for 55 and 56. Okay. Uh, like, Lord, in the night I think about your name and stop. What is he saying? I think, I think, about, I think on your name in the night and I stop doing something. And. I think on your name in the night and stop this, I don't remember what that word is. This is my comfort that you, this is my comfort that you have given. Yeah, it's pretty close actually to what we've got. Sometimes his stuff has something really interesting to say, but no, nah, it's pretty close. All right. Um... 
Let's see. Questions and comments so far? I'm going to go to 53 next to talk about. Burning indignation? Yeah. So, burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. So is that why they're wicked? Because they forsake the law? Um, is that why they're like wicked? Are they wicked? Uh, you know, what is, what is his indignance um, about? That anybody could ignore the law. Mm. And if they don't obey the law, they, they are wicked. Right. Yeah, I, I would say that is correct. Spoken like a lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> got that right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so the psalmist is recognizing what their big sin is. Their big sin on top of all their... I guess, or you could say underneath all their other sin, their big sin is forsaking the law, just forgetting what God's law says. And isn't that what we talk about in society today too, right? So we have all these evils in society, but underneath all those evils on the surface, the core of the evil is even that law that's written on our hearts, people throw it away, right? So... All of a sudden, and I'm, you know, you know what's coming out of my mouth next. So that's why we kill babies. That is why we killed our, kill our elderly when they're inconvenient to us. Um, when they're, not that there's no other opportunities. Yeah, you know, that's why we do euthanasia. That's why we have abortion. Um, because we have completely discarded God's law, which says, this is life. This is, all life is this, and this is what you have to do. You know, these are, these are my laws. So if you just discard what the Bible says, you have no guidance. You have no precepts that you are keeping to guide you. Uh, not like the psalmist does who keeps on it. He knows he can't do it, but he keeps laying hold of it because he knows that is the way of life. But the wicked, that's why he's indignant because the wicked have abandoned that, right? Question. Sure. This might sound really stupid, but... If you're wicked because you reject his instruction, mm -hmm. right? when we sin, we're rejecting his instruction. Mm -hmm. We all sin, so are we, sure. all, are we all wicked? I think it's the difference is we're repentant, right? We're, we're penitent, so that's not, we're penitent, yeah. You know, so that is the difference between the the, the time old, the old time story of everybody saying, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, no, no, that's not what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is someone who claims to love God and then lives this horrible life and never repents for any of it. That's hypocrite. That's a hypocrite. That's someone who says they do one thing and they're doing another. That's what a Pharisee was. I'm keeping God's law. Look how holy I am. No, you're not, stupid. You're not even getting close to the law and keeping it. You just think you are, which is what Jesus was so upset with them about. Uh, but that doesn't make us hypocrites because we sin. It just makes us sinners. We know we're sinners. You know, we're not fooling ourselves that I'm, I go to church, so I'm better than you. That's a hypocrite. Okay, I go to church because I need the medicine and the forgiveness of my sins because I suck. That's a real person. Okay, so that's the difference. Uh, so someone who just throws it completely out, that is the wicked. That's the wicked. The, the rank unbeliever who maybe even has heard the word of God says, I don't want nothing to do with that. I'm going to do what I want because that's what I'm going to do. What is right in their own eyes. Right. What, what, what I want to do and what makes me happy is what makes me happy. So I'm going to go do that and you go do your thing. All you people in church are hypocrites anyway. No, we're not. You know, we go to church to hear once again, yeah, I am a sinner. That stuff I did this week, I probably shouldn't have done that. I need to repent for that. And then I receive that absolution and I get to go out there again and listen to all the wicked who tell me I'm stupid for doing this. That's the difference. Okay. So, and then at another level yet is the pagan, which we don't use that word today much anymore, but the people that just don't believe in anything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they believe in some made up mm -hmm. God from who knows where, like our friends, the Druids in Madison. Did I tell you guys we have Druids? Did I tell you? We have Druids in Madison. Sure. Mm. You know, like the old timey people in the in England that used to like lock a 
tie a virgin up in a tree and set her on fire or whatever they used to do. It's like, we got those in Madison. They're not doing the sacrifices, but I guess they go dance around in the woods and do whatever. They have a website. It's like, really, I so want to go, but they're so going to throw me out. I, just, I want to see what they do. I just can't believe this dead religion from 1,300 years ago is still around, but whatever. They have Satan worshipers. Yeah, but the, see, the Church of Satan doesn't actually worship Satan. That, that's the joke. You know, the Church of Satan is all about you. You know, it's, it's, they're, they're not really, you know, like, hail Satan. They don't really do that. They do that in the movies. What it's really about the Church of them. It's all about the Church of me, the gospel according to me. And that's what each individual one, that's what they do. Um, sometimes people try to make it more into a devil worshiping thing, but that really isn't too much of what it really is. The Church of Satan is just anti-Christ, period. It, you know, it's just anti-anything. And again, some groups do try to make it in the devil worship, but I think those are all posers, to be honest. Maybe some are serious about it. I don't know. Um, oddly enough, the, the groups of atheists have been having atheist church on Sundays. And what's Atheist Church, you ask? Well, they, like, COVID probably killed it, but Atheist Church is a place for them to go on Sunday morning to gather with a sense of community like we do because they're like, why can't we have that without religion? And it's like, well, that's not why we meet, but okay. So they have this literally Sunday go to meet and they go to a room with their Starbucks, I guess, and they sit and they talk for an hour and then they go home. It's Atheist Church. Well, then you have the Unitarian Universalists yeah. Yeah. that have the, the pagans and the secular humanists and the Jews, and they're all together sharing. Because it's all good. It's all good. It's but like, that's more yeah. the ecumenical. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, the Fruit Loopy kind of Lutherans, a lot of them go to, they're on board with that. The Fruit Loopy Lutherans are the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, by the way. I probably shouldn't call them that, but they're the other Lutherans that embrace all kinds of stuff that is not scriptural. So, so I make, I occasionally make fun of them because I'm not a nice person when it comes to that. I guess I mean, it's just it's silly. They they, they they will give communion to anybody without teaching them what it is. They might not know what it is. They don't care what it is. It's just well, we're all, it's a community. We'll do it together. It doesn't mean anything. And it's like, okay, there you go. That's where you lost me. They don't think it's the body and blood of Christ anymore, so it doesn't matter what you do with it. There you go. But I'm not picking on them. They're not all nuts yet. They're working on it. But it, just like there are churches in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that shouldn't be in the Missouri Synod because they've gone a little nuts. They, they're doing things they shouldn't. Um, there aren't any of those around here. California? Yes, there are. We went to a funeral with the ELCA <laughs> church. Yeah. And they had communion. The female minister said we use chip and dip method. I'm sorry? What? The chip and dip method. But, oh. not chip, but just referred to as chip no. and dip. Yeah, nice. I mean, that technically is what we're doing, but <laughs> that's why we have a nice fancy term for it. It's yeah. a tincture. A tincture. <laughs> But yeah, it's one of the one of the most dangerous things. Yeah, one of the most dangerous things about having lady pastors, and that's nothing against ladies. Okay, can a woman do the job a pastor does? Certainly, but God gave it to men in the Bible. That that is our that is our doctrine on that, and I'm not going to turn aside from it. That's no slight against women. That's just what God made that office for men to do, just like God gives things to women to do. And I'm not turning tonight into that. But the, the bad thing about that is, is a lot of these ladies, especially one of the ECLA ladies who I, I read her book, I think I love watching her to go, wow, how does she have that magnetism? And she did a sermon at their youth gathering. And it's like, because she looks cool. She's like in her mid 40s. She's got like buff arms with tattoos and her sleeves rolled up so with, with a collar. You know, so she's got short sleeves. Clericals. She looks like she just got off her motorcycle because she probably did. She's a motorcyclist. She, she looks cool. And then she talks and she sounds cool. And you have to pay attention waiting. I'm like, wait for the heresy. Wait for the heresy. There it is. 
she mentioned Jesus, she mentioned the cross, she didn't mention it's for you. And it all turned into us. It's all about us and what we think and what we feel. It's not about what Jesus did for you. She didn't preach the cross. She didn't preach the forgiveness of sins. It's like, it was all social gospel. It was empty. It was devoid of anything. And then they got ready to have the Lord's Supper with all these kids. And it's just like, ugh. But you didn't tell them why you're doing it. And there was no cross. There was nothing. There was no grace. It was all about me again. And uh, I mean, can a guy get up there and preach that? Yeah, but the danger with her is she's so charismatic. You want to hear what's going to come out of her mouth next, you know, and she's kind of earthy and, and, you know, not very careful. She has dropped F-bombs from the pulpit, just saying. Yeah, but you, you watch her and go, man, the kids are eating this woman up alive. And read her book and like, wow, your book's really good. You know, like her church sounds so cool. They're so inclusive. They have all these people there. Uh, but she won't call a sin a sin. It's, you know, it, it just stops short of actually making the law convicting and then falls far short of the gospel offering its sweetness. It's a big problem. But you, it's real hard to discern it because it's subtle. And some of it's not so subtle, but you just listen to her and you would feel so good leaving. It's like, wow, I got a lot out of that message. I feel good. And you don't realize that you were slowly dying. Your faith is slowly dying because she didn't give you Jesus. And that's the problem with any of these uh, other TV preachers like Joel Osteen, who I love to pick on too. I mean, how many books has he got to write, write that do not call you a sinner and hardly mention Jesus ever except in passing? Prosperity gospel. Yet he can keep, you know, name it and proclaim it. Or is that Rick Warren? It's one of those two. Anyway, sorry I went off on a tangent again. I, I developed a tangent myself. Nobody sent me on it. I went willingly. I was bad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you should hear me when I talk to myself. Okay, so I remember your name in the night. I love this. These two verses. And I've, I've lost the two verses again. Where'd it go? Oh, yeah. 55 and 56. I love those two verses because... So often, you know, when we're little, we have this irrational fear of the dark. It's like, but mom, you know, that my stuff on the chair over there looks like a monster. Yeah, I see it's not that when you turn the light on, but when you turn it back off, it turns back into a monster, right? And then we grow out of it. But how often are we afraid in the dark? That's when you're alone with your this. <laughs> and does that terrify anybody else that you're it's all me and what's going on up here by myself? Ugh, because that's when everything starts running through your head. That's where your day runs through your head. That's where the things you shouldn't have said that came out wrong go on repeat, right? So in the night, wow, that's when we're vulnerable. And we're vulnerable not even to the devil because we're doing his job for him. We're, we're vulnerable to ourselves, to that, that stuff that's going on inside. You know, so, you know, I remember your name in the night because that's when I'm scared. That's when I need your name. You know, this is when I'm really afflicted. And then, you know, then the devil's going to jump on Luther. So I told you that one already, right? What Luther said about when the devil is tormenting you in the night, what to do. Mm. Okay. Luther said you have to fart and drive the devil out. He literally said that. <laughs> that's, that's classic Luther. That's the kind of stuff he would say. He, he was a, a monster in the pulpit preaching, but when he was just talking, he was earthier than that. He goes, yeah, you need to fart at the devil. It's pure Luther, sorry. <laughs> out. Get out, that devil. Been, that must have been interesting, all that beer and pickles. <laughs> oh, and don't forget the pickled herring and everything. Like, he had ammunition. So, this is my ammunition against the devil. We should make another Luther movie that's not too serious. That would be great. So, right, so that is when we really need to... And isn't that always how we pray, though? I mean, have you ever been in an... An accident is taking place, and you're kind of going, okay, Lord, I don't, I, this is how it ends. I think I'm going to die. You know... But just in that moment, you see, this could be how it ends, Lord, so, you know, help. What am I going to do? Or at night, Lord, it's just me here alone thinking these thoughts. What am I going to do? 
is when you have no place else to turn and you're just completely alone for that moment. That's when we remember, oh yeah, I can talk to him because he's always there and he's always listening. Uh, and what does he want to hear? He wants to hear what he gave us to say, which is great. You know, I was arguing with another pastor, I won't tell you his name, but you know him. But he was arguing with me about it's stupid to have canned prayers. And he was railing about the prayer of the church. Which, yeah, they give it to us, but we don't have to read the whole thing every Sunday. We can tweak it. But, but he was saying, you know, we shouldn't have canned prayers. God doesn't want to hear our canned prayers. It's like, well, why did he give us the Lord's Prayer? Mm -hmm. It's the same words for thousands of years. And he must want us to say it because he gave it to us and said, when you pray, say. Like but he doesn't want to hear canned prayers. Huh? Uh, whatever. That's the first canned prayer. That is the first canned prayer. Well, actually, oh, these God. are the first canned prayers. But they're not so canned, the Psalms. Yeah, so in the dark is when we remember, you know, I think when we're in the dark, we revert to children, which that's who the kingdom of heaven belongs to. Someone with the faith of a child. A child has, uh, I don't want to say that, a child has infinite trust in mom and dad, infinite trust when you teach your child about God. That kid has infinite trust in Jesus, right? I mean, he believes 9,000%. It's not until we get older and we start thinking that we manage to screw it up. Uh, and when we're alone in the dark, well, that's when we revert to children because that's what we're afraid of, right? So that's all of a sudden we can have an honest faith with no baggage so that we can just directly go, okay, I need a little help here. The point being that that's when our fear and anxiety really goes after us is when you're, when you're alone in the dark or alone anywhere. But, uh, but then he felt comfort. The psalmist finds his comfort in the name of the Lord in that situation, which reminds us to do the same thing. And then, let's see, the words, and I keep your law. Or is it, I remember your name in the light, in the night, and I keep your law which reminds us that we're supposed to keep his law in the daytime too. But what do you think that means? Okay, so I remember your name in the night, Lord, and I keep your law. You're sitting in bed, praying, thinking about God. You remember his law, and now you keep his law. What does that mean to keep his law in the night? I would say meditate on it. Mm -hmm. Before you go to sleep. All right, so <laughs> meditate on what he's done for you. Mm -hmm. Good. What you've read that that day. Mm -hmm. Try to push, like you said, the, the thoughts out of your mind of what you should have done and you didn't, or what you said, should, what you ended up saying and you shouldn't have said. Right, right. If okay. you think about what God did for you, meditate on that. That will push those thoughts away. Good. And you're dwelling on God. Exactly. Good. Now, the reason I kind of said it that way is because, you know, I keep your law to our ear sounds like I'm keeping the commandments, right? Well, no, we're not. We know we don't. So how can we say I keep your law? Well, that is a phrase that's in all, a lot of Psalms, too. We're going to see that in a lot of Psalms. It says, you know, Lord, I keep your, I delight in your law, Psalm 1, right? Starts off with the main theme of the Psalms. I delight in your law and I meditate on it day and night. It doesn't mean we keep it. When it says I keep your law, I like to think of it when I'm keeping the law, it means I'm keeping all those uses of the law in my head. The first use is the stuff that I know, just know right and wrong from when I was a child. Right, that's what's written on our heart, first use of the law. The curb keeps society from devolving into chaos. We don't have to worry about that one because that's just a given. So the main two uses, the second use is the mirror. So if I'm keeping the law, I am keeping the uses of the law. The first one of which is that mirror that goes in front of me and says, you're a poor, miserable sinner. So there in the dark, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And then that should make me meditate on the gospel that I can't keep it. I'm never going to keep it perfectly. Jesus did, and he died for me so that my sins would be forgiven. And now I'm comforted because, oh yeah, even that stuff I did today, he's going to forgive that too. Not because anything I did, 
but because that's the way grace works. When we put all of these verses together, if we go back to um, start back with, well, pardon the glass of that, 50. Well, it starts right at 49, actually, when we start remembering. Mm -hmm. Then it says, uh, you know, in, upon what, ah, uh, this is my comfort in my affliction. Mm -hmm. Then we go down to 50, 51. It's almost like the world is coming at him. The proud have had me in great division. Mm -hmm. I remembered your law. Indignation had, uh, I remembered your judgment. Mm -hmm. 53. Indignation has taken over me because of the wicked they were at me. Mm -hmm. And they remembered your law. Yep. And we go back over here and then remember in the night, I remembered your law. And even 54, before you get to 55, all right, your statutes are my songs as I'm going along in my pilgrimage. Right. Exactly. Your statutes, I'm singing your law. So uh, for every right, aspect right. of our life, Whatever comes at us, you know, when the world comes at us, I have kept your law. Okay. So we have to kind of put them all together and you get the big picture of, oh, if I do this, you know, if you remember this. Good. I remember it and uh, you said as you. Now let's take it a step further. Verse 49, what commandments that look like? That This one's a little bit of a stretch. The first one actually, but all right. So the first verse, remember the word to your servant, which you have made me hope. This is my comfort, my affliction, that your word has revived me. That's, thou shalt have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Okay? And then the arrogant utterly deride me, yet I turn not aside from your law. Because what, when someone has, is assaulting you verbally, what do we want to do? We don't want to put the best construction. It makes me irritated that, that they changed the catechism. They don't say in the meaning of the of the commandment anymore that we will put will defend him, speak well of him, and put the best construction on any everything in the meaning. That's to the uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, so we always said that's about as a Lutheran a phrase as you get. Put the best construction on that. You're not doing it. They took that out, and it's like man that that phrase has so much power in it okay so did you put this in the best possible way when you went to talk to this guy that's the commandment i'm thinking of when it says okay the arrogant deride me that i do not turn away from your law that law that says don't say what you think you know, don't go back at him the same way he came at you okay so he's he's thinking about the commandments obviously because it's the law so okay when they come at me with this i remember your commandment i'm not going to act like that back okay i've remembered your ordinance of old and comfort myself i'm indignant because of the wicked but i am not i'm not going to do what they do i'm not going to turn it back on them now i just like to think of what commandments these passages of the psalm might have you thinking of uh, that is the way I know I talk about Luther an awful lot, especially doing Psalms, because the Psalms were just huge. A huge influence on him, which in turn has been a huge influence on me, because uh, I study his writing quite a bit. Uh, but every Psalm, you can attach a commandment to it. Usually one of the first three. But you can always attach a commandment to it, and you can always attach a petition of the Lord's Prayer to it, at least. So there is something we can be praying for because of their prayers. And there's always some commandment that it's pointing you to. And then this one, I think this section in particular, I think it is pointing us to anything that has to do with speaking to our neighbors. So bearing false witness, uh, not using the Lord's name in vain. Why is that? Because we uh, try to convince somebody of everyone you could do. Uh, uh, you know, I swear I didn't do this. You know, it tempts us to lie or not to lie or to... When you put God's seal approval on something, people think, oh, yeah, well, he must be... I swear to God, you know, I want to be careful before you do that. Uh, yeah, so each section kind of can make you think of a commandment, I think. Uh, and, and just, he kind of walks through a day almost, doesn't he? You know, you can almost think of, of like somebody starts out in the morning, your day starts pretty good, and then the affliction starts. And then he's alone in bed at the end of the day and goes, wow. Okay, but hey, I'm thinking back on all this stuff that happened today and I remember your law. I observe your precepts. Not that I keep them, but 
that I can pray to be forgiven for when I didn't during the day. And then for us, of course, we pray that we be <coughs> forgiven for the sake of Christ. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I read into that one a little bit, but not maybe not in a bad way. Now, when you talk about it pointing to Christ, don't forget your promise to me, your servant. Mm -hmm. Is that part of it, the promise of a Savior? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so this is just another way of showing yeah, and, where it's going to go. And if you want to make it messianic, you can go a step further that think Christ saying the words. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, and then that takes on a lot more meaning. Uh, but yeah, I think you can read it all those different ways. I mean, tradition, tradition says Jesus prayed all 150 from the cross. We could only hear parts of them because everything he said came from a psalm uh, in one form or another. So would it make sense that a Jewish man did that? Sure, they are the prayers of the, of the church. Uh, I believe it. I think that's a tradition that could possibly very probably be true. And as he said on the road to Emmaus, to the Emmaus disciples, and they opened up, he opened up the scripture to them before they got there for dinner, and it said everything in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms is about the Christ, is about him. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember, he told us himself, these are all about him. So that is a correct way to look at them. And um, when you mentioned the law and the scripture, you could also, when you talk about like here, I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. You can substitute scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. You can actually because say it's, it's all of. When you think of law, you think of don't do this. Right, right. But if you think of the scripture, which is the Old Testament, is the law. The New Testament is grace. Right, you absolutely. Could, you could think about the entire. Well, very scripture. much. Very much, but the, and that is very much a psalmist's praise, whether David wrote it or who wrote this one, whatever. Whatever psalmist wrote, when they talk about, you know, my delight is in your law, I keep your law, I keep your statutes, it doesn't mean we are keeping that law perfectly. It means I keep it. I keep it. I have hold of it. And I don't always do it, but then you'll forget, you know, in you is forgiveness. Well, you, you know, can it, add... Maybe you're not keeping it, or we know we can't keep it, but we have knowledge of it. Right. And we're striving to, right. at the very least. Right. Not that our striving gets us anywhere, but we strive. We, we try, even though our trying doesn't count. But it mm. ultimately, you know... It's not what we can it's, do. It's one of those, as Protestants, all of us being Protestants, it's one of those things that's hard for us we know we have to be careful of our language because we say oh we try harder we try to get a little better each day we know it doesn't merit us any grace but by god if you have living active faith you ought to get a little better as you get older right we hope um yeah there's nothing wrong with saying that uh, we should grow in holiness which sounds weird in a modern day but yeah we should get a little more holy every day doesn't mean we sin hopefully sin less as we get older but um, it's always going to be a struggle. But that, that is a Bible study for another time because I would like to do that about, they talk about our progression and holiness in our life and then uh, how there are varying degrees of reward in heaven, which scripture says. We don't, that doesn't tell you how or what. You just read that and go, oh, okay. It's going to make sense to us when we get there. That's all I say. <laughs> but, you know, we'll be done according to the good we've done. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I was back on the trail of the, the in the night, mm -hmm. remembering thy name, and that got me to thinking about Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. there's another scripture, and I can't remember where it is, maybe someone else can, that we should have the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Let's, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. Paul Where is that? Colossians. Is it, I, what I Four? thought, I, I, well, maybe I, I didn't go far enough. I'll be shocked if it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I'm not good at doing but that. But anyway, what, but I, 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 I just trailing, read that not long ago. But where I was going off on was 
Well, if our mind is the mind of Christ, then in the night I should be wrapped up in his thoughts, what he would be addressing. You know, I should know his law and his words that well that no matter what happens, I should be able to, through Christ, because he's the only one that can do this. First Corinthians two sixteen. Corinthians. I wasn't even. I had Paul right, and that was it. <laughs> First Corinthians what? Yeah. First Corinthians two sixteen. First First Corinthians two sixteen. First Corinthians two no. sixteen okay. says. Okay. Well, we have the mind of Christ. Yeah. Uh, well, this is good. This is actually a good thing to read. Okay, so go back to fourteen. Uh, no, let's go back to. We have received not the spirit of the let's, world. Yeah, let's go all the way back to 12. Now we have, re- we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And that's Isaiah 40, 13, I believe. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? Isaiah 40, 13. Uh, yep, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or his counselor has informed him. See how it's different, right? Because the English, the, the New Testament is quoting the Greek Old Testament. That's why the words are different. But yeah. Right, so the natural man, or like and Paul say that, and some of the early church fathers, and even our confessions will use that phrase, the natural man. What's a natural man? Well, it's a man born of a man and a woman, born in the natural way. There's only one that wasn't, and that was Christ, right? Because he was incarnate, made incarnate by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is true man, but he is not a natural man. He did, was not born the natural way. Oh. I just like throwing it out there, but they use that phrase, the natural man. And they use that a lot in philosophy, too. A lot of the philosophers always talk about the natural man as if there was any other kind. Uh, The natural man. Right? We can't understand them because talking about things things can only be perceived, spiritual things can only be perceived by someone who is spiritual, someone who has the Holy Spirit. Right, because we can't understand, we can't receive the gospel without the Holy Spirit. You know, we can't receive the forgiveness of sins without the Holy Spirit. We're not capable of knowing that we need to repent without the Holy Spirit. So it's all a gift. So someone that does not have the Holy Spirit, this it's foolishness. Why are you doing all this stuff for? Why do you have to do that? You know, that goes right to what the psalmist is hearing from these outsiders. Why are you doing this? This is stupid because. The psalmist is perceiving spiritual things, and to them it is stupid. The word of the cross is folly, right? To them who have no hope. I think I just butchered that phrase, that verse. You've How does that go? Okay. What is that? The word of the cross is folly. It's my memory verse for this week. Isn't that good? Really? No, it isn't. It's next week's maybe. I don't know. Anyway. The word of the cross is folly, Paul, Paul wrote. You know, to, to those who have no hope, hearing about the cross is just stupid. What is this? Okay. Well, I really got us off topic tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like 25 after 8 already. Any any questions after all that rambling by me tonight? I'm sorry. Oops.
Yeah, I do love, I love those two verses, though. I remember your name in the night. You know, I'm, and some nights I think we need to do that. In Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Six. Yep, there you go. That's great. When I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my hope, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. That's a great, this is a great psalm. This is a great psalm, the way it's, what comes after that. You know, it's almost as if, you know, he starts off giving praise to God for all the glorious things that he has done for him, and then how his soul thirsts and yearns for him. Uh in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You know, he's using that image of, okay, you know, a life without your word is dry and weary. Uh, Thus I've seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So now he's praising. He's giving thanks for all the good stuff that has happened. His soul is satisfied and his mouth offers praises. And then it goes, and then there's actually a section division there. And then it goes, okay, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches for you have been my help. And so he keeps on grabbing hold. He's grabbing, he's just staying tight on the word. And he goes, but those who are seeking to destroy me, now he's not praying to be delivered for them. The way he does it is, okay, these guys will go into the depths of the earth to find me, but they're gonna die. He's just like, I know you're gonna take care of it and you're gonna destroy them. They'll be prey for foxes. Right, they'll be delivered over the power of the sword. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory. And the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. So it's just like, I know you've got this. That's, this is really a neat psalm, especially in context. I like that. Thanks for pointing that verse out. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. Any other questions, comments? Like I said, I'm sorry, I went completely off topic tonight. Too much, I think. Isn't that what this is for? Probably. <laughs> and we've gone Don't through so much of the Bible. We've other other people have fed into yeah. it. And, yeah, okay. And developed. Hey, if you guys are happy, I don't mind. I don't, I just, I go off on tangents sometimes. But sometimes they, they, connect and sometimes they kind of whiff. I don't know. But I think it keeps it interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna I am gonna stop using this set of notes that I've been using for this because it just it it's feeding into my scatterbrainness because there's <laughs> the notes are scattered themselves. So it all it does all it does is feed my own um, nonsense. I do want to point out that we, yeah, it is at the end of that section. This is the end of the, the end of the section that we really didn't talk about much. Um, but the very last two verses, 63 and 64, even 62, I'll go back to 62. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is full of your love and kindness, O Lord, teach me your statutes. It's just kind of a nice, it rounded back from where it started. So I'm going to rise at midnight to you and give thanks to you because your law is just. And then, hey, I'm also friends with all the other people who think your laws are just. So it's, he's talking about the community of believers, right? And it's like, I, and I'm, I'm the companion of all of them. We are together. And then of people who keep your precepts, you know, The earth is full of your grace that you've given to everyone. And then the very last, it says, teach me your statutes. I've I've read them. 
I know them, I'm saying them back to you, and I need you to continue to teach them to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. The same the way that the other section ends, you know, 56. This has become mine that I observe your precepts. And I'll jump back, 48. I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. 32. I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. 24. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. The last verse of every section is reflecting again on laws and statutes. And it always, either it has a little bit of differences where it's okay, I've, they're mine, I want you to teach them to me. A different thought, uh, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of pieces of gold and silver, one we haven't got to yet. Uh, my heart, may my heart be blameless in your statutes so I won't be ashamed. He's asking in different ways, keep giving me your law, keep bringing it in front of me. I delight in this. Keep showing me I'm a sinner because I need to keep hearing that. And it just reinforces. That's kind of neat how each section ends like that. Okay, now I'll stop talking. Okay, so we'll probably do a couple more sections next week. Is anybody watching evening prayer, our evening prayer thing that we put on YouTube? I'm worried. We have been reading the same article of the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. It's called Article 5 in the Reader's Edition, and it's about the gospel. And it just goes on and on and on. It's like, how many days? I've been reading like a, three columns of it out of the book each night in the evening prayer. It's like, when are we going to be done with this? I'm afraid people are going to go, we're still reading that article? I'm not well listening to this. <laughs> it just keeps talking about how in the actual proper book of concord article four and article five is one article and it just goes on forever it's about justification how we're declared righteous before god and then sanctification so it shows us what the law does and shows us what the gospel does mm -hmm. uh, and it just goes on and on and on for pages and pages and pages like these poor people listening to this it's like because it sounds like that's the same thing we heard last night yeah kind of <laughs> it just it keeps going what what is it? Is it a uh, is the, website? Uh, for no, no, I, I read that. I, I read Evening Prayer each night. It's on my YouTube channel. Oh, on YouTube. Yeah, news. so you, okay. can, you can check it out. Um, uh, in the newsletter that you got? Yeah, there's a link. Oh, okay. Yeah, there'll, there'll okay. be a link. On the last page, well, next to the last page in the newsletter. Okay. Okay. Page. Yeah, there, there's playlists on my channel of, say, like, worship services, Bible okay. studies, and then okay. it'll have morning prayer, evening prayer, okay. the, and then the so worship then services. Hear. Sunday service that I uh, Yes, yes, you, you can. can't go to church? Question mark, and then it will gives you a, oh, a link okay. to his. Yeah, but our that's in the newsletter. But the evening prayer I read from the Book of Concord. Okay. So I, I do. It's New Testament in the evening, Old Testament in the morning, and then it's a writing from like a church father in the morning or something like that. But then in the evening we've been reading through the Book of Concord, uh, like we did the Large Catechism, which is great. Did the Augsburg Confession, which is short. The apology to the Oxford Professional in the Defense. Book of yeah, it's all in the Book of Concord. Just so goes on and on. Like that. Yeah, that you can read it for free online at bookofconcord.org. I always that, forget that. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not the best English translation, but it it works. It's based on the German Book of Concord, or the yeah the German Book of Concord. So it's a decent translation. It's just a little old fashioned, um, but it goes. The apology goes on and on and on and on. It just really does. Uh, yeah, everybody hates studying it. It's great to know it, to read it, but when you have to, like, okay, you got to read this tonight, you're just like, ugh, it takes so long to read. But it's worth it. Uh, anyway, okay.